Good morning, everyone. My name is James Rankin. I am recording this video as an addendum to a blog post that I have done about creating a dynamic start menu, um, which will be linked in the description of the video. If you're looking at it on YouTube, if you're looking at this video embedded directly on my blog, then completely ignore what I just said. So what we are trying to do is show you how to create a dynamic start menu that kind of recomposes itself every time the user logs in. Yep. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this test on this Windows 10 um, machine, which is here, which is the 1903 build. Um, what I have done, I'm logged on as an administrator to this machine at the moment. We haven't applied any rules that control the creation of the start menu. And we've installed three particular apps. I've installed three PDF readers as an example. So I've installed Adobe Reader 11 that you can see there. We also have Foxit Reader which you can see there and we have Sumatra PDF which you can see there. So at this present moment those shortcuts are inside the all users start menu and if I right click on one of them and choose open file location you should see where this points to. So it's the shared start menu so C Program data, Microsoft Windows Start Menu Programs. In there, we have a shortcut for Smart PDF, a shortcut for Adobe Reader 11. We have a folder with shortcuts for Foxit Reader. So every time a user logs into this machine using this image, it will iterate through this shared Start Menu area and present those onto the Start Menu. So what we want to do is control that dynamically so we can show certain applications that are installed on the machine to users that are entitled to use them and prevent users that aren't entitled to use them from seeing them at all. Essentially, to be able to control the presentation of the applications on our start menu simply by changing the user's Active Directory security group memberships. So I've said in the blog article, if you've referenced that, that we're going to use FS Logics app masking to do this. So I have installed on this machine also the FS Logix apps rules editor um, so we can create the rules that are needed to do this. Um, in an enterprise environment, you'd probably have this not installed directly on the image or you'd have it on a reference image or, you know, somewhere you can access those applications. So first of all, we're going to create a new rule for each one. So first of all, we're going to create Adobe Reader, if I could spell. 11 whoops i've actually put x exclamation mark <laughs> instead of x1 who cares let's just go on with that let's ignore the fact that i'm typing with boxing gloves on so you get the option to create a rule from installed programs if it's installed programs that you're using which we are in this instance so it'll do it automatically for you if you were delivering the applications in a different way say you know like app v or something like that you'd have to go in and select what you wanted to hide manually with app v it's very simple you just hide the app v package in c program data app v and literally just hide the shortcut so it's not horrendously difficult to do it in that fashion but we're going to do it the automated way so if we set it off scanning that particular application and it iterates through the registry and the file system as well as everything else you should see it's found all of the stuff that goes with the application that it's going to hide or reveal but the most pertinent one that we're talking about when it comes to the start menu is this one so in this case it's going to hide the link on the start menu there's that and the rest of the stuff is mainly registry items and obviously the uh, the product install directory but that's the one that we were kind of most concerned about at this particular moment now it's very key to manage the assignments so what we're going to do is we're going to change everyone to yes so if you know about fs logics it iterates through the rules from the top down it reads all of them and applies the most applicable sort of set of rules dependent on the user now what we also want to do is 
add a group that it's not going to apply to. So therefore, it will be revealed to that particular group. Let's see if I can remember the syntax of the applications that I create. There you go. Syntax of the groups that I created, rather. So if we add in the app Adobe Reader 11 and change that to does not apply. So what will happen is if a user logs in and this rule is applied, it will be hidden unless the user is in that app Adobe Reader 11 group. Yep, pretty simple. So that's that one created. Let's create another new rule and call this Foxit Reader. Spell it correctly this time. Let's just let it do its stuff again. So for Foxit Reader, very, very similar. And you should be able to see, he says, as he looks desperately up and down for the start menu folder. There it is. That one's a folder rather than particularly just shortcuts. So it's going to hide the entire folder as well. Let's create the assignment for this. So everyone, yes. Let's add a group. We should have a app. Foxit Reader. Set that to no. Okay, on that one. And finally, let's just create one for Sumatra PDF. Again, we can use the automatic scanner. Let's scan that. It's completed. Very, very simple, this one. Um, there you go. There's the hiding rule for the shortcut, which is the one we're primarily concerned with. Let's create our assignments and add a group. And this group will be app underscore s, and it will not apply to that group. Right, so we've done all of that. That's all saved nicely. Now, <clears throat> what you need to do, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're familiar with FS Logics, when you just create these rules on the little machine, they are just put into a subfolder of your documents folder. And here we have each of these, we have um, a rule file, that's the rule we created, and a rule assignment file, which tells it what to be assigned to. Now, in an enterprise environment, you would store these centrally and have them copied out to the relevant rules folder on each of your machines via whatever method you would choose to do that. I'm sure you're all very clever people and can manage that without any problems. What we're going to do is just copy them directly to the C program files, FS logics, apps, rules folder. Now you see in the rules folder, there's nothing in here at the minute and there's nothing in the compiled rules folder either. What we will do is when we pop them in the rules folder, when we paste them in here, they'll be picked up by the FS Logics driver instantly and compiled and popped into the compiled rules folder. They take effect absolutely instantly. So let's just paste them in there. Give it a bit of UAC goodness. They're in there automatically. And already you can see they're now compiled and in the compiled rules folder. So those rules are now active. So now what we're going to do is, first of all, I'm going to sign out of this machine. Then I'm going to switch over to a domain controller over here. And let me find some users. OK, which users can we use? We've got one here, J Rankin 3. I have been doing some experimenting with profiles recently, so let's just check there's no weird and wonderful profiles assigned to that. Um, so let's add this user to one of or two of those test groups. So let's just add this one to the Smart PDF group. And then let's add number four to, I'll just check its profile as well. That's good. We'll add this one to the Adobe Reader 11 group. And j and 5. Get rid of the mandatory profile, and I knew I'd been tinkering with it somewhere. Add this one to the Foxit Reader group. So J rank and three, J rank and four, J rank and five. As we log those in, you should see they get a start menu with just specific applications on there. Even though we know that those applications are all installed on that machine, so let's give it a go. So let's try first J rank and three. 
can remember the password I've done no optimization at all on this image so it'll probably be a horrendous lock <laughs> on time which is really embarrassing to um, do that when you're such a proponent of uh, optimization of long on times as I am so let's just see how long it's going to take running through all the awful UWP app provisioning and all that malarkey thanks for that Microsoft There is, well, more than rumours that Microsoft are going to abandon the UWP apps paradigm that gives us this horrendous first log on time. I would be so, so glad to see that actually come to reality. It's very, very frustrating to continually have to deal with this. okay logged in wow took about a minute or so um right so this user is now logged in successfully still a bit of churn going on for some reason okay so we now have all our stuff has rendered so let's see what we see on the start menu i've totally forgotten so i'm going to quickly check <laughs> This was JRankin3 and I added him to the Smarter PDF app. So we should say the Smarter PDF app on there, but neither of the other PDF readers. And there you go. There's Smarter PDF. It has created this start menu dynamically for me as I've logged in. We can't see Foxit Reader. We can't see Adobe Reader 11. That's exactly as we wanted it to look. So let's sign out. Now, if I mentioned in my article, if you're using any form of profile management, it's very important to um, not capture the user specific areas of the start menu, because then if you see how I'm going with this, I'll just log in the second user this time. Whoops. Because you don't want to potentially have shortcuts get created in the user area of the start menu and then have them kind of persist in the other one. Now, if you're using a local profile um, on a machine, then you can deal with that by essentially just emptying that folder as you log out. You'd have to create some sort of log off script or action to handle that. So delete the, 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 the user specific stuff as they log out, just to make sure that every time you log in, you're creating it just from that shared start menu area and see program data. But if you're using a profile management tool, if you're in a persistent, a non-persistent kind of environment, then simply exclude that from your profile management tool. Okay, let's just wait for that one to finish its bits and bobs. So, <laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, right, so this one, this second user, which is number four, should have... Should be able to see the Adobe Reader, but nothing, none of the other ones either. So we can see Adobe Reader 11, we can't see Foxit Reader, we can't see Smarter PDF. So every time we log in, this is dynamically created based on the user's, um, on the user's Active Directory group memberships. I won't bother with the third one. You get the picture. It's created dynamically each time. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to log back in as the administrator. Now, the administrator account that I'm using, as far as I'm aware, he says, as he goes and checks. Um, if I could remember where it was. Is it a power user? Da, 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 no, I can't even remember where I put my damn accounts. That'll be it. Um, right, that's not a member of any of those app groups. Yeah. So when the administrator logs in, you should actually see none of those things. None of those applications. So let's log that back in.
this administrator should already have a profile, so it shouldn't take ridiculously long to log in. There we go. Right, so this one, account shouldn't see any of those. And as you can see, there's no Foxit Raider, no Adobe Raider, no Smart PDF either. So this user's entitlements don't entitle them to en command prompt popping up, bizarre. Um, don't entitle them to any of those apps, so they can't see any of them. So that start menu has been built without any of them in there. So that's really all there is to it. And that's the the the, the sort of the easiest way I can think of to build a dynamic start menu as the user logs in each time. And if you reference the blog article that I've got linked to this, or if you're already reading the blog article, then it should tell you everything that you need to do. Now, this is the area you see, the programs area of the start menu, where all that stuff goes. Now, what I'm just going to do actually is, just for fits of giggles, is I'm going to go in and remove those FS Logix rules now, and you should see them all just reappear straight back in there. So if I go in here and delete these rules, I'll actually just minimize that down there. So you probably, hopefully, see it happen. So if I literally delete those rules from there, so they're no longer applying. There you go. You can see Foxit Raider and Adobe 11 and Smart PDF shortcuts have all reappeared on there. So now the, the, the restrictions are no longer there and my user is entitled to say those and could use those shortcuts again. So that's all very cool. So there it is. I just wanted to demonstrate that. Um, this is how I go about delivering start menus on Windows 10 and Server 2016 and Server 2019. I think it's the absolute easiest way to do it. You put all of your shortcuts into this area, the all users profile start menu. You don't put shortcuts anywhere else. So if you're doing package deployment and things like that, always put the shortcuts in this area only, not on the desktop or anything like that. Clear the public desktop. Make sure the default profile doesn't have any um shortcuts in there because they will contribute into there use this as the sole source of your user's start menu shortcuts and every time they log in their fs logic will read their group memberships if any of them have changed then they will be shown a different set of start menu icons based around that. Now, the only flaw with this, as I've referenced in my article, is if a user pins one of these things to the taskbar or the start tiles or something like that, and then you remove their entitlement, they'll have a blank icon that doesn't work anymore. Um, I've been thinking of various really complicated ways I could get around this, and then I thought, you know, if a user gets a blank icon, they can just right-click on it and delete it. You know, it's not that much of a disaster, and you know for sure that they won't be able to get back to it. So there you go. Um, I hope that's useful for you in reference to that blog article. Thank you very much.